Good evening, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us here today uh, on this edition of the monthly market webinar. Um, it's uh, been a unusual year, uh, you know, with most of these uh, broadcasts of the webinar taking place from home. Uh, work from home has become the new normal. Uh, but in a way, uh, it has also uh, changed our own understanding of how we can reach out to so many of you, our investors, our partners, our distributors, uh, because you know this technology and this medium allows us to reach out far more efficiently uh, than you know jumping on a plane and traveling to a city uh, could ever do so. Uh, so in a way, we are also delighted that you know this technology, this method of reaching all of you. Uh, has worked so well. Uh, we are delighted to see the number of people who, you know, continuously uh, started to register for these events. The numbers have picked up quite significantly, and I am particularly happy uh, to see the kind of questions uh, that we've been receiving from you all in advance of the event, uh, because that tells me that you know there are many issues, there are many things that are. Uh, troubling you that are perhaps top of your mind and really the whole purpose of a forum like this is that we are able to directly address uh, perhaps many of those questions many of those doubts and clarify some of these issues uh, so it's been a reasonably uh, 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 you know interesting year so far uh, and when i say that i say that in the context that if you had uh, gone to sleep in December last year and woken up uh, for this webinar today, uh, you would have looked at the market and said, okay, it's a fairly boring year. It's up 12, 13 percent. Uh, I guess it's been a very normal kind of a year. That's, of course, by looking at the market. Uh, and then, of course, uh, if you looked around, you would realize that it's actually been an extremely eventful year. Uh, the first pandemic in over a century, uh, you know, the market which first sort of collapsed. Uh, so much pain, so much suffering. People have lost their loved ones. Uh, so it's obviously been a lot, a highly emotional year uh, for everybody, not just because of the markets, but also for what's been happening uh, with their friends, with their family, with health issues and so many other challenges that this pandemic and COVID-19 uh, has brought to each and every one of us. Uh, it has certainly touched our lives in many ways, uh, and I'm sure the impact of this will stay with us uh, in the way that we think and act perhaps going forward as well. Uh, so it's been very emotional from a market perspective because of the collapse which happened in March where the markets went down by more than 30%. And then of course, a dramatic recovery from the low means that we are finishing the year at uh, you know record levels for the market in terms of being a, a, a lifetime high. Uh, so that's the context in which we are doing this webinar today. Uh, so as usual, the way we are going to do this, uh, is that first I'll run you through a presentation uh, and I'll tell you what we'll be talking about today over there in particular. And then after that, we'll start running through some of the questions that we've already received. Uh, my colleague Niranjan uh, will be reading out those questions. And of course, if you've got some questions, uh, there's still time to send them in and uh, you know Niranjan will try and pick them up and then uh, uh, read those out. Uh, so without any further ado, let me sort of uh, get the presentation underway. Uh, just bear with me a minute. Great. So here we are. Uh, we are at the monthly equity market webinar, December 20. Uh, what are we going to be talking about today? Uh, we are going to be talking about these issues that you see on your screen. Uh, we'll talk about the earnings recovery that's uh, visible in the data that came out for the September quarter. Uh, we already touched on this in last month's webinar. Uh, last month, we also talked about the formalization and consolidation happening across industries. Uh, we'll look at some more snapshots of that. Uh, we'll look at valuations. Uh, where do we stand in the historical context? Uh, we'll also look at the current outlook for the markets. Uh, I also thought this was a 
good time to sort of stand back and think about how we at UTI, uh, myself, my team of fund managers and analysts, what have we done during this uh, volatile year? And, uh, you know, what does our portfolio positioning look like today? Uh, of course, it's always guided by the investment process. Uh, but, you know, we'll run you through some snapshots to tell you how things have stayed uh, pretty much the same. Uh, so first off, uh, we'll take a look at this, uh, which is really the Nifty 50. Uh, on the left side, you see the sales growth for every quarter going back to September 2015. And on the right side, you see the profit after tax growth uh, for every quarter, uh, the year on year growth as reported by the Nifty 50 companies. Uh, as you can see, we were in a slowdown even before the pandemic hit uh, in the quarter of March 2020. Uh, the June 20 quarter was the worst impacted with a 30% decline in revenue. Uh, the September quarter started to see normalization as we moved into a phase of uh, unlocking our economy. Uh, revenues for the Nifty 50 were down 7% year on year for that quarter. But the profit performance was spectacular. Profits actually went up 17% year on year for the quarter, uh, which as you see on that right side bar chart is actually pretty much one of the best quarterly performances ever uh, for the Nifty 50 companies, uh, matched only by 18% in the quarter of March 2019. Uh, so that's a very interesting outcome which happened. Uh, and we talked about this last time as well in terms about how uh, as corporate India has been able to get out of the lockdown uh, because of the supply side disruption that took place, the larger companies, the well-established companies, which were able to get their supply chain back in place, uh, which had uh, uh, you know, access to credit, some of them were able to recapitalize, they were able to get back on their feet much faster. And this resulted in both market share gains from the informal sector and from the unorganized sector, and also significant cost savings uh, were to be found because of much lesser competition. When you combine these two factors, with record low interest rates, which have now transmitted through the economy, then you end up with a situation where despite the decline in revenues, these top 50 companies of the country managed to deliver a year on year profit after tax growth of 17%. So it's a combination of these factors, the gaining of market share, the cost savings, the reduced competition because some companies were not able to get back on their feet and the lower interest costs, all of these put together combined into this kind of a performance in terms of uh, profits actually growing 17%. Let's look at the much larger trajectory of earnings, uh, uh, which you see for the Nifty 50. And as you can see at the extreme right, just look at the last three bars. It is now consensus expectation that earnings for the year ended March 21 will decline by only 1% as compared to the year March 2020. Remember, when you think about GDP, this is a year in which GDP is actually going to decline about 7 or 8%. Of course, as I keep saying, it's not a typical cyclical collapse in GDP. It's a reduction in GDP simply because nobody could produce and nobody could spend for pretty much about uh, uh, you know, 90 to 120, maybe even 150 days because three to five months is when we were in a fairly intense period of the lockdown. Uh, so despite a GDP collapse, these 50 companies, because of some of those benefits that I talked about earlier, are actually going to, are forecasted rather, to report flat earnings. Uh, now, as a result of the rebound that we are seeing in economic activity, remember GST collections have gone positive year on year, automobile sales positive year on year, farm output, sowing numbers, all strongly positive year on year, uh, power generation positive year on year. So many economic indicators are reflecting the rebound. And as a result of that, uh, the forecast now is for a very strong earnings uh, rebound in the year ended March 22, uh, with earnings expected to grow, or consensus forecast 
of 38% earnings growth in March 22. Uh, so the performance of the top 50 companies in the country, in a sense, you could argue uh, much stronger than what the actual underlying economic trend is, where you have a decline in GDP of about uh, 8 to 9 percent, most probably in March 21, and a rebound of about 9 to 10 percent GDP growth in the year ended March 22. Uh, this trend is also visible now in the way that consensus expectations are behaving. Uh, again, look at the extreme right of the chart where those three lines show you the earnings forecast for FY21, uh, the line above that FY22, and the green line FY23. As you can see, from the low point in you know March, April of 2020, these lines have started moving up. This is reflecting not just the expectations of the rebound as we have exited the lockdown, but also the fact that companies have delivered very strong earnings and the analysts are now starting to factor this trend into their forecast. So we actually have a significant upturn underway in earnings forecast. And look at those three other lines on the chart, which go all the way back to the left extreme, which is the earnings forecast trends for FY18, FY19, FY20. As you can see, in all those cases, the lines continue to only decline with very brief upward interruptions. Uh, this time around, we've seen this play out for a few months. Uh, we'll have to see how sustainable the upturn is, uh, but it is interesting because the pattern is now looking slightly different. Uh, moving on, we'll go on to the next point that I talked about uh, in my opening comments, which is about consolidation. Uh, what you see on this slide is really about the consolidation uh, which is taking place in the economy. Uh, so when you look at the slide, it talks about uh, what was the market share of some of the key players in every industry. Uh, uh, for example, in the case of bank credit, the top six banks in the country had 37% share of credit in FY10. By FY20, uh, the market share increased to 48%. But more interestingly, if you look at the incremental market share of these companies uh, between FY17 and FY20, the incremental market share goes up to 68%. So just look at that right extreme right column incremental market share for sector after sector. For every sector, the incremental market share going to some of the stronger players in the industry is very, very high. There has been a significant degree of consolidation of market share in the hands of a few strong players. And this consolidation is happening across sectors. And this is leading uh, and feeding into some of the strong trends that we saw in the last quarter in terms of strong earnings growth. Uh, in general, this is a continuation of the process which has been happening in the economy, I would say going back all the way to 2016, when we started with demonetization, which affected the informal sector, uh, then the transition to GST in 2017, which forced companies to come into the organized sector to report their numbers. And some companies who found perhaps those costs too high to bear uh, actually had to exit and give up market share or seed market share. So these benefits have continuously transmitted to companies in the organized sector, leaders in every sector. Uh, it's not necessary that it is large cap. For example, in a sector like pipes or luggage, no company is a large cap company. They're all mid cap or small cap companies. But in their own sector, they are in a sense the market leaders and they have benefited from the fact that perhaps unorganized sector companies, smaller regional brands, regional companies have suffered more during this period of transition, including, of course, now this whole COVID-related issues in the last uh, year gone by. And as a result, uh, we are continuously seeing them being able to gain market share and improve profitability. Uh, so this, I believe, is now putting in place a very strong engine uh, for corporate uh, profit growth. Uh, of course, there are also risks that come along with this, but you know we'll talk about that later. Uh, but for now, it is this kind of consolidation and gains in incremental share, uh, which are now setting the stage for a strong profit recovery. Uh, so with this out of the way, let's move on 
to the next slide where we look at the valuations. Uh, so this is the valuations of the Nifty on a trailing basis. And as I keep saying, actually looking at PE multiples has become meaningless at this point of time because of the impact of the lockdown. Uh, so particularly the trailing PE multiple because it is picking up the June quarter and the September quarter where we were going through that process of normalization, it does not reflect the normal earnings. It's very important to remember this. We talked about this in an earlier webinar. Eventually, the true value of a company is nothing but the profits that it will generate over its lifetime. Now, there is no easy way to calculate and estimate that number. So we tend to use a shortcut. That shortcut is nothing but the price earnings ratio, where we measure the value of every unit of earnings for the current year or the year gone by in terms of its price. But that is only shorthand for the value that that company will generate over its lifetime. In a year like this, where you have a pandemic, the PE becomes a meaningless metric because it is not capturing the true earnings potential of the company in a normal year and its potential growth over the next five years, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. So which is why I think the PE has not really been a very accurate or good indicator during the current year. Uh, so what in that sense is an indicator uh, which is not connected to earnings. Uh, we've been reiterating this. It's much better to look at the price to book because the price to book in a way tells you what you're paying relative to the physical value of the assets. Uh, it does not take into account brand value. It does not take into account the growth potential of the business. Uh, but because it is a static balance sheet related metric, uh, it's a much better indicator to look at, particularly during a year like this. Uh, as you can see, in March of 2020, the price to book was an absolute cheap territory. The only time it had been as cheap as this was in the 2012-13 period. And in fact, that the low point in March, uh, it was pretty similar to the low point for price to book which came all the way in 2009. Uh, so it was a remarkably cheap market. Now, without doubt, as the rally has played out, we have seen even this metric go back into expensive territory. So there is no shying away from it. The market has gone from being remarkably cheap. It is now trading in the expensive territory when you look at the Nifty 50 trailing price to book. So the top 50 companies in the country, as reflected by the Nifty 50, the price to book has once again entered expensive territory. What does it look like for the rest of the market? Uh, so what we have here is the price to book metrics on the left hand side for the Nifty mid cap index and on the right hand side for the Nifty small cap 250, the trailing price to book. Here, the picture is looking rather different. Yes, these Stocks have also rallied, but the price to book on the mid cap is still in the fair value territory. In fact, it's only at a 15-20% premium, 10% uh, premium to the long term average. And as far as the small cap index is concerned, uh, with some of the recent strength, uh, it's now trading at about a 20% premium to the long term average. But it is still within the sort of boundaries uh, of what we would call fair value. So from that point of view, uh, I would certainly say uh, the top 50 companies in more expensive territory, the mid caps and the small caps still sort of in reasonable value territory, not as cheap as they were during the point of maximum panic earlier during the year. But that is always the case, you know, and I keep repeating this. You will always see cheap valuations when there is bad news and people have very low confidence in the future. In March, people did not know what would happen. Everybody was worried about what the future would look like, about the impact of the virus. That is when you get cheap valuations. Today, we are a lot more comfortable that because of the miracles of modern science and so many uh, uh, scientists and technology and medical professionals, we now know that vaccines have been approved. They're already being rolled out. And there is a greater degree of comfort that we can now look for the economy to get back to normal trajectory of growth and a very clear rebound. When you get the sound of positive news, 
the market is no longer cheaply valued so this is always the situation that you will be faced with as an investor can you act when valuations are cheap in spite of the bad news that is around you and at the same time can you exercise caution when uh, there is great amount of confidence and excitement about what the future holds because valuations tell you to be so uh, those who can master this will over time prove to be good investors at uti we rely on the investment process to guide us through these kind of markets and volatility uh just to sum up again so the nifty 50 now in expensive territory the mid cap and small cap still sort of trading in the fair value territory uh let me move on now to the outlook uh, and while i call it outlook it's not really a outlook in terms of what the market will do in the next 6 months or 12 months uh the reality is that i don't have a crystal ball i don't know what will happen we are not in the business of forecasting what markets will do we are in the process of Uh, uh we are in the business of managing portfolios following our investment process using our investment process sticking to the particular portfolio philosophy that we have articulated for every strategy and that is what we believe over time should help us create alpha our target is alpha which is the outperformance of the benchmark over time rather than really trying to forecast the move uh, having said that what are is what where do we find ourselves at this point of time uh, in terms of context uh, the vaccines are now being rolled out in the western world and eventually we should expect them to find their way in india as well meanwhile of course the absolutely great news and i thank the lord about uh, is that in india the case load has been very very uh, mild in fact it's come down quite dramatically from the worst time in about uh, uh, early uh, august early september from almost 1 lakh cases a day to 30000 cases a day uh, at the same point of time cases in us and europe are actually surging and they are having to go into fresh series of lockdowns so we are certainly blessed it's something we should be thankful for and grateful for as 2020 recedes into the rear view mirror uh, to give you a very simple metric uh, if you look at the statistics in europe Uh, in a country like let's say sweden uh, they are recording 5000 cases a day with a population of 1 crore uh, india with a population of 138 crores uh, which is you know 138 times sweden has a case load of only 30000 a day which is six times more than sweden that's exactly how dramatically different uh, india statistics look of course it's not just india if you actually look at the entire tropical belt of asia including many parts of north asia uh, going all the way into africa the case loads are very low so at this point of time for whatever set of reasons it's really the western and the northern hemisphere which are struggling with covid 19 and the vaccine most probably is very critical uh, to sort of help them uh, put covid uh, behind them whereas in india cross our fingers we seem to be on a improving trajectory for whatever set of reasons the fed will remain supportive there was a us federal reserve meeting this week and they have indicated that they will remain supportive this liquidity uh, created not just by the us fed uh, but also by all other central banks has created a wall of liquidity which has supported all asset classes and helped them to uh, rebound uh, in india of course we worried about inflation but at this point of time the mpc is of the view that the surge in inflation largely reflects supply side issues and they will continue to have a supportive approach uh, companies that can navigate a challenging period are well placed to accelerate growth gain market share and profitability as they face less competition in the subsequent period that is the textbook case that we have been seeing playing out over this quarter and remember we have been reiterating this principle very early in the crisis even before we saw the earnings that this is something which will happen and you know that's exactly what corporate performance is now showing us uh, we already talked about the pe and the price to book uh, without doubt as i said the market is now trading in expensive territory particularly the large caps 
And therefore, what is now more important is that the recovery in earnings needs to be sustained uh, for the market to sort of do well. Uh, otherwise, the market will really be testing uh, the limits of how much support it is getting from earnings. So earnings recovery now becomes very, very crucial at this point of time for equities. Uh, so that's where we are in terms of the current market context. Uh, so, as I said, I thought this was a good point to sort of look back uh, at what have we done during this volatile market? Uh, what has the investment team at UTI? Uh, it's a fantastic team I have of 19 people. You know many of them, particularly the fund managers, but also there's a fantastic team of research analysts and junior analysts supporting them. And it has been a complete team effort in terms of navigating this year uh, by continuously reviewing and understanding what is it and where we add value and being guided at all points of time by our investment process. Uh, what I have here on this slide uh, is just to show you how being guided by our investment process has meant that we have not gone into this crisis saying, oh my God, there is a crisis. My portfolio is no longer appropriate. I need to throw out the stocks in my portfolio and rebalance them with something else. Uh, what we have shown here on the left-hand side is three of our strategies, master share, UTI equity fund, UTI value opportunities. Look at the top five holdings in the portfolio as of November 19 and the top five holdings as of November 20, virtually unchanged. Uh, yes, in equity fund in the middle, you will see one name is no longer part of the top five, but that's partly due to price performance, and Larson and Tupro Infotech is now among the top five, but that stock is up more than 150% this year, while the Indusind Bank is actually still down 40% this year, and that's why it has dropped out of the top five. It's really price-related movement rather than the portfolio exiting uh, or uh, you know jumping in and out of stocks. On the right side, you see the top five sectoral exposures for master share, UTI equity fund, and value opportunities fund in November 19 and today in November 20. Once again, the key point that I would make is look at the fact that these exposures have largely stayed consistent. There are changes in the percentages, but those are percentage changes driven by the price movements. We have not overnight tried to say we need to you know, exit one sector and go to a different sector or exit one company and go to a different company only because the pandemic happened. Why? Because our portfolio construction has always been guided by investment process. And at the heart of our investment process are two simple principles. Do these companies generate cash flow? Are they capable or currently generating a high return on capital? Companies that do these two factors consistently or do it well, and in some cases when they are supported by valuations, we believe that gives us the ability to stay invested in companies even during difficult times because the companies are able to come out of it. And in many cases, they actually come out significantly stronger. So not to say that there have been no changes in the portfolio, but the point I want to make is that our thought process being guided by these two pillars, our portfolio construction, the structure of the portfolio has largely stayed the same rather than having to go in and out. And that is what I believe uh, is uh, really at the heart of the fairly strong performance that we have had during this year, navigating 2020. A large number of our strategies have generated significant alpha compared to the benchmark. And I would pin it down to this disciplined approach of stock picking driven by the process and supported by a team uh, which is you know, uh, blessed with a lot of experience and a good review process. Uh, let's also look, uh, uh, this is for the other uh, sort of you know, five funds. Uh, I won't spend too much time in it. You'll notice that there are a lot more changes in the middle fund, which is UTI mid-cap fund. Uh, but remember, this was also a fund which experienced a change of fund manager in September 2019. Uh, so there was a change in fund manager. There was a change in the philosophy of the fund. We changed the philosophy. And therefore, this is one fund where the holdings have changed. But again, uh, I've taken the change here from November 19 to November 20. If I had taken it from Jan 20 to November 20, the reality is that you will not see much difference 
in the portfolio for the Metcalf Fund as well. It has also been rather stable in terms of how it has operated. Uh, let's look at another slide which very elegantly captures this thought process. Uh, as you're aware, if you look at our fact sheets, all mutual funds will publish on every sheet related to a particular fund the portfolio turnover ratio, which means how much have we churned the portfolio at every uh, point over the last uh, preceding uh, 12 months. And as you can see over here, in equity fund, master share fund, and value opportunities fund, there was no significant increase in portfolio turnover. The range in which the portfolio turnover remained was largely consistent. And in fact, it actually came down in some cases. The only fund where portfolio turnover was higher was essentially the mid-cap fund. But again, as I said, this fund saw very high turnover, particularly during the October 19 to uh, uh, Jan 20 period. And that is what is getting picked up in the data. And then once you get past that bump, uh, it also comes down quite significantly in terms of portfolio turnover. Uh, why is this important? This is important because the more you try to turn and churn the portfolio, the more the cost. We are not running portfolios of uh, you know, 1 lakh rupees or 2 lakh rupees. These are 4,000 crore, 10,000 crore, 15,000 crore portfolios. Every time we make a mistake, the cost of exiting that mistake and going into a new stock can be quite significant. So what the process does is it keeps us disciplined, it reduces the number of mistakes, it keeps the portfolio turnover low. And as you know, you will you can find the analytical data uh, on many uh, you know, third party providers of what is a particular fund's turnover and how does it compare to the industry average. Across the board, you will find that UTI's portfolio turnover ratios are significantly lower than the industry. And at the same time, we've been able to generate uh, alpha during this difficult year and also over the last three years. And I would attribute that essentially to the discipline of the team and the adherence to investment process. Uh, so this is what you know. I thought it was a good opportunity because people always ask me, how do you deal with volatility? And I always say, you know, you deal with volatility by not thinking about it, but rather focusing on what is in your control. What is in our control? The way we do research, the way we review companies on a regular periodic basis, the fact that our investment process is anchored to cash flow and to return on capital and valuations wherever we believe it is relevant in some strategies. And because we run with that framework, we don't ever feel the need unless, for example, like in the mid-cap fund, where we had a change of approach and therefore it necessitated a change in the way we run that fund. But other than that, everywhere else, it's steady as she goes, no changes. And I think that is really eventually uh, a significant ingredient uh, and we only control the inputs. Eventually, performance or alpha is an outcome. We don't actually control alpha. We control our mind. We control process. But I think the portfolio turnover is an indication of how we operate. And uh, I think this is part of the reason why we've been able to navigate 2020 quite well with our investment process. Uh, this is just a quick summary of the positioning of some of the uh, key funds. Uh, and I just wanted to once again sort of highlight the consistency that we have in terms of portfolio approach. Uh, maybe I'll just take two examples to put it in perspective. Uh, for example, the UTI equity fund and UTI value opportunities fund. The reason I take these two is that they're very distinct from each other in their thought process. And as you can see, uh, you know, both the equity fund and the value opportunities fund have a sort of flexible approach in terms of large, mid and small uh, allocation. Uh, uh, the large cap allocation of the equity fund is 66 percent. The mid and small cap put together is about 34 percent. In other words, it's underweight the benchmark on large caps. It is overweight the benchmark uh, when it comes to mid caps and small caps. Uh, same for the value opportunities fund. The difference in the two portfolio strategies is visible in the third set of data there called R1, R2, R3. The high return on capital companies in UTI equity fund form 91% of its portfolio. The benchmark has only 61% such companies. Uh, so essentially, the portfolio strategy is significantly overweight on high return on capital companies. 
But a value strategy like UTI, value opportunities, is actually only 54% in companies rated R1, which are actually the high return on capital companies. So it is actually underweight on high return on capital companies. Uh, and on the other hand, if you look at value opportunities fund, it has almost 46% in R2 and R3 rated companies where it is effectively overweight the benchmark because it has that value tilt. It is looking to buy companies at slightly more attractive valuations and trying to get the benefit of companies where return on capital may improve in the future. Not just because it is a forecast, but because past data tells us that it is possible. Whereas a fund like UTI Equity Fund, which is all about quality growth, uh, high return on capital and free cash flow, uh, it has dominant investments in that R1 rated category. When it comes to cash flow, UTI as a house has a philosophy of staying with strong companies, preferably C1 rated. So all our strategies, whether it is uh, equity fund, master share, uh, value opportunities, all have uh, much higher than benchmark exposure to C1 rated companies. In terms of valuations, the thought process again, therefore the outcome becomes very different. Uh, UTI equity fund, when you see the slide ruler, has a price to book higher than benchmark, price to earnings higher than benchmark, return on equity higher than benchmark. On the other hand, value opportunities, uh, price to book discount to benchmark, price to earnings discount to benchmark, return on equity also uh, lower than benchmark. So this is just the way that we continue to run. So these are two different portfolio strategies. The portfolio overlap is limited, but both have stuck to their process during the year. We did not try to change one strategy to the other because that is not what we do. We like to run the strategies with discipline. And at this point of time, both strategies are demonstrating an alpha, positive alpha outcome uh, year to date. So uh, I think, again, it just goes back to the fact that you can get alpha from different approaches. You have to run it in a disciplined format. Uh, so this data, of course, is available every month in our fact sheet in the Ready Reckoner. And I would urge you to continuously refer to this because the reason we share this with you is to give you the comfort and knowledge that these data points are consistent and we are running the portfolios with a very consistent approach. And that is what really helps us navigate unusual times and volatile times as we have seen during this year. Uh, so with that, I'll halt this presentation here. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, this has given you some perspective on what's been happening in the economy. Uh, the fact that you know profits have been uh, increasing quite uh, dramatically for the corporate sector. Valuations in some sections of the market have become richer. But at the same time, uh, we, earnings are showing a strong picture, but we need those earnings to come in strongly uh, to be able to sort of sustain the market. Otherwise, there is a risk from a valuation point of view, uh, without doubt, particularly in the large cap segment of the market. And in terms of dealing with volatility, it boils down to sticking to process and discipline. And that is what helps us navigate unusual times. We don't know what the next challenge would be. Uh, in 2008, we didn't know that there would be a global financial crisis. Uh, and just like that, we didn't know at the beginning of 2020, there would be a pandemic. We cannot control, uh, we cannot predict these sort of unforeseen events. What we can control is our methods by staying disciplined to process. And that is what we believe allows us to navigate challenging times in far better fashion. Uh, so I'll halt over there. And uh, Niranjan, we can, uh, you know, start with the questions. Sure. Uh, thanks, Vitri. Uh, while we have already received uh, many questions uh, uh, for today's session through email, that is on uh, ask uh, uti at uti.co.in and also on the chat box uh, here. So just a quick reminder to the participants uh, to post their questions on this uh, chat box. We will uh, try to take them. Uh, the first one for uh, today goes like this. Uh, as we understand, uh, positive news on vaccine, faster than expected uh, economic recovery, continuing uh, fiscal and monetary policy support has been some of the key drivers for the current market rally. So question to you is, what are the key drivers do you think could keep this momentum going and why do you think so? So, 
you know, the way I will actually answer this question is to go back to the point I made earlier. We are not in the business of predicting. Neither could we predict that COVID would happen. Neither could we predict as to when that vaccine would come. Of course, we are continuously reiterated that we do believe that given that the whole world's best and brightest minds are working on finding the cure and the vaccine, something good is bound to come sooner rather than later. We are delighted to see that it has happened, even though so much life has already been lost. But we are not in the business of trying to continuously forecast what will be the next trigger. Uh, so that is not really the thought process with which we manage portfolios. Having said that, uh, I will go back to what I said earlier. Uh, I think at this point of time, particularly in the top 50 companies, valuations have expect, uh, entered that expensive territory. Doesn't mean that they will immediately collapse. You know, Even if you go back to 2018, 19, you'll remember that it went to expensive territory, slight correction, then it pushed up again. So valuations don't tell you when the prices will either collapse or when it will suddenly rebound from a low level. But it tells you when there is some level of risk in the market. Uh, I think, therefore, from my point of view, uh, for the market to sort of do well, what becomes very important is that earnings come through, as I said earlier. Uh, so I'm not really looking at it from a trigger point of view. To my mind, what is very crucial, both from an economic cycle point of view, as well as the market cycle point of view, is that we now get a strong profit-driven recovery. And eventually, hopefully, companies will use those profits to reinvest and to, uh, uh, you know, drive to some degree the investment cycle within the economy as well, which will then make the cycle a lot more sustainable. Thanks, Vitri. Uh, there is a follow-up question uh, to that. So do you see any headwinds in the near term that could hurt the market sentiment uh, significantly? And uh, could there be more uh, stimulus, uh, fiscal stimulus uh, coming in, uh, in, especially in the upcoming union budget? A good question. You know, there are always risks in the market. We should be aware of it. Uh, I talked about this earlier today when I said that we don't fully know the reasons why. Uh, but it does seem that at least in India, the trend in terms of COVID infections has shown a very encouraging pattern even before we get the vaccine. Uh, if anything were to happen to cause those numbers in India to spike up again, uh, it would certainly be a cause for concern. Uh, I think the policymakers are very clear that there is no scope for a national lockdown or even statewide lockdowns. We are only talking about very localized uh, uh, sort of, you know, uh, control of activity if they see a spike. But we have not seen a spike. Uh, but that certainly remains one risk that, you know, if you do see a spike, you could have localized lockdown, which would invariably disrupt economic activity and the trend of recovery we have seen. Uh, the second thing that I think is something that gives us a little bit of concern uh, is that while we are looking through the inflation data, saying that it is largely related to supply side disruptions, uh, what we are also very clearly seeing uh, in recent months is that many companies across a range of industries are taking price hikes. Are they taking these price hikes because there are cost pressures? Certainly. But is there also an element of uh, higher confidence uh, to take these decisions to raise prices because of lower competition? Uh, that could also be an element. Uh, but that would eventually cause policymakers to worry uh, because that would then cause inflation to structurally move higher. Then it would no longer be an issue of supply side disruptions. Uh, so I think that's something we'll have to watch out for. Do we really start to see inflation spike higher? That could cause a problem for policymakers. I also want to point out one thing, which is that India has actually not experienced in its inflation numbers or with consumers a benefit of significantly lower oil prices over the last two, three years. Because government has actually used this as an opportunity to push through tax duty hikes, which are reflected in a much better fiscal position when you think about the country as a whole, consumers may not have a surplus, but government has benefited. But unfortunately, the problem with this methodology is that the increase in fuel prices is pushing inflation higher as well. Uh, so that, again, is perhaps something that government will need to think about, that while this policy of uh, benefiting by taking tax hikes to the credit of government helps the fiscal, it actually has a up, uh, spiraling effect on inflation, and that is not desirable. 
Sure. Thanks, Vitri. Uh, the next question uh, goes like this. On a YOI basis, most of the global market index uh, have underperformed the uh, Indian uh, market, uh, that is Nifty 50, particularly some of the emerging markets by a significant margin. So what are the ma major factors that are contributing to, uh, contributing to this positive uh, inflows from FPI and FIs over the past several months? So uh, first of all, just factually, I'm not sure that uh, question is correct. In fact, uh, you know, it came in advance, so I just rechecked the data. Uh, as on date, the Nifty is up 13% approximately for the year. Uh, if you look around the world, uh, the U.S. markets are up about 15% for the and you know, much, much higher for the NASDAQ. Uh, when you look at Japan, it's up actually almost equal to India, 13%. China, the Shenzhen 300, up 22%. Korea, up 26%. Taiwan, up 18%. But yes, India has done better than some of those, uh, uh, particularly if you look at what we used to call the BRICS economies, and maybe you add Turkey to that as well. The only two which have done well are essentially China and India, uh, Brazil, Russia, uh, Turkey, South Africa have this year. Uh, they've done well in the last quarter, but over the year they've done poorly. So just two points to make. We are not doing particularly better than the rest of the world. We have done well, but many countries have done better than us. As I said, you know, Japan, China, Korea, Taiwan, the US itself. Europe has done very poorly. Uh, the Middle East has done poorly because of oil prices. So I would say we are somewhere in the middle of the pack. And perhaps one reason why, uh, you know, uh, I would still say that the outlook for India when most foreigners look remains quite positive uh, is that they still look at the structural growth story in India as being something which really makes India attractive to them. Uh, so I would actually say we are in the middle of the pack in terms of performance. We are not at the top. We've done better than some of the uh, emerging markets which are primarily commodity exporters. So Brazil, Russia, South Africa, primarily commodity exporter countries, they've done far worse. We are more a consumption driven local economy. We have done far better. Uh, so that's a good thing. But we are by no stretch of imagination, uh, you know, the best performing market year to date. We are somewhere in the middle. Yeah, sure. Uh, the next question is on uh, banking sector. Uh, the question is like this, the bank uh, Nifty uh, has underperformed both uh, Nifty 50 and broader market. However, uh, uh, this sector is actually showing uh, some signs of recovery over the past few months. So the question is, how are NBFCs placed over uh, banks, both private and public? And uh, does their growth path to increase mar increasing market share remain intact? Okay, there are many questions in that. Larry, very quickly, let me just make two points. One is that, remember, and we talked about this in one of the early as well, uh, which is that banking is primarily a leverage business. Uh, and therefore, when there are loan losses, and of course, uh, in terms of loan losses was much higher uh, in March, April, May than it is today, because we've seen the economy come back to a fair degree of activity and normalcy, much better than what we may have expected in March, April, May. Uh, so as a result of that, where we are today is that, well, there are still some it's not that this is a uh, economy in which nobody is feeling pain. As I said, it's a bit of a twin speed economy. The unorganized, the informal sector, the urban services oriented part of the economy, they are still experiencing significant pain. Uh, the agriculture sector, the core organized manufacturing and services quite well. And that is what the economic data is picking up. Uh, so we are still in a situation where there is some concern about eventually losses will come through for the banks and NBFCs, uh, but it's not going to be anywhere close to the worst case number that we were assuming six months or seven months ago. Uh, so in that sense, certainly the outlook incrementally is much better. The second point that I would make, which was there on one of those slides, is that even in the banking sector, we are seeing significant consolidation. There are only few banks and NBFCs left who have both the benefit of a strong balance sheet. Uh, already they're demonstrating their ability to control the credit cost despite this difficult cycle. And finally, they have the trust of depositors or the bond 
which means they are able to get cheap money and they are the ones who will gain market share over the next few years uh, so when we look at financials we are quite excited that some of them uh, will perhaps gain market share and pricing power and grow much faster over the even if aggregate credit growth does not pick up very dramatically because some of the lending institutions have been impacted on nbfcs and housing finance companies Uh, what i said earlier applies to them as well some will remain uh, dominant and gain market share some have already weakened quite significantly over the last 2 to 3 years and are losing market share so those survivors in the ndfc space as well will benefit from uh, growth and higher profitability thanks vetri uh, next question is uh coming year uh, 2021 is expected to see a transition from virus to vaccine Uh, however given that has declined more than any other country how is the growth prospect for the coming year is uh, looking and which are the sectors of pockets that are potential for a catch up okay there's uh, many angles to that first of all let me once again say market is very fast market discounted the lockdown very swiftly in 20 days before anybody knew what happened it was all over on march 23 that was the low uh in fact that was just the day the lockdown started and but it was really the vaccine also gets discounted very very fast and i would say the vaccine is already pretty much discounted in that sense and uh, the market is discounting normalcy and profit growth uh, at some level uh so uh, i don't think that merit once again i would go back to gdp growth to say that gdp growth cyclicality is material but in the year gone by there is no point of looking at gdp growth because for 3 months government told everybody please stay home uh, don't produce consume other than what you need to to just stay alive uh, so when the economy goes through that period growth does not have the same connotation and the same impact that you would have had if you got negative gd cycle event for what reasons in the cycle event and as a result of that production plunged and therefore consumption plunged uh, that would be the negative gdp that i would worry about what we have experienced this time is a statistical factor it's like everybody took vacation for 90 days and therefore output is lower and therefore gdp is lower Uh, some people affected more some people affected less some people clearly benefiting uh, but again point being that i think you know uh, this is not really uh, the most material point so i am not too concerned about this gdp up down as i mentioned next year gdp's growth will be plus 9 plus 10% uh, doesn't mean much because if you think of the gdp of uh, you know 20 as 100 uh, we are going to come down to 91 a 2021 and then if we grow 10% we'll come back to 122 so there has certainly been a loss of one one and a half year goal but there has not necessarily been that extent of a setback and if the corporate sector comes out of this with strong profitability it could actually drive a new business cycle uh sure vetri thanks uh just a quick uh, reminder to the participants so if there are uh, there questions on the session uh, which you would like to share with us you can uh, post it on the uh, that will help us uh the next question uh, vetri is like this uh, this is on uh, the uh, uh, production linked incentive the scheme which is uh, government has come up and the question is like this which are the major sectors that can pli scheme and what uh, what is its, uh, its likely impact on gdp growth i think you partially answered yeah so the pli scheme um, you know i think the sectors are already disclosed right so uh, one is mobile phone manufacturing which doesn't really affect it, affect listed companies too much because it's mostly in the hands of unlisted companies or directly foreign multinationals uh, then of course the other sectors that it is targeting are areas like automobiles pharmaceuticals chemical ingredients there are 13 sectors which are named you can just look it up it's there and all the thing some of the larger companies in uh, those sectors uh, particularly if they are listed companies they may benefit uh, because if they are able to incrementally increase their exports 
the incentive would be almost 4 to 5% of the incremental production that they do from those facilities uh, i think overall from a gdp growth perspective it should have a positive impact for two reasons one uh, you are um, reducing the imports that you do from the rest of the world which is one of the targets of the pli scheme which has a positive impact on gdp secondly uh, you are also trying to use pli as a means to incentivize global companies to uh, or even indian companies to set up manufacturing facilities and become part of the global supply chain uh, which again will ensure that some value addition of that will get captured in india which is again gdp positive there are already various reports out there that by 2027 uh, it could benefit india to the tune of almost one and a half uh, percentage points in terms of gdp in terms of the incremental uh, so roughly i think i've seen the math of 25 to 30 basis points a year Uh, benefit uh, which over a five year period would accumulate to about 150 to 170 basis points sure uh, the next question uh, vetri is on uh, uh, the funds uh, this is particularly the large cap uh, fund per se uh, question goes like this a common narrative among investors about large cap is that actively managed uh, funds uh, have struggled to beat the uh, uh, 50 in the recent years so do you feel that uh, actively managed large cap funds can create alpha significantly going forward so uh, i would put it like this um, uh, if you look at the alpha potential of individual strategies uh, clearly the alpha potential of uh, large cap funds is lower than that of mid cap funds which in turn is lower than the alpha potential of small cap funds but the risk reward ratio in large cap uh, strategies is superior to that of mid which is in turn superior to that of small cap so when you look at it from that perspective uh, i would say that there is still a strong argument uh, to look at large cap strategies and i think what we have demonstrated and you know swati who runs uti master share uh, for us has demonstrated that if you run it with a very clear principle and her philosophy is really all about investing in companies which have uh, uh, you know the comparative advantages in the sector the companies that have the best franchise in the sector in which they operate then it is possible to create alpha so i would not agree that you cannot create alpha you can create alpha but yes the alpha outcomes will be smaller than what you could get in a small cap strategy Uh, the alpha outcomes in small cap could be higher but then remember that when you look at risk adjusted returns the risk adjusted return is more favorable in large caps as compared to small caps uh, i would think that therefore you know all uh, these strategies and remember even in the large cap strategies up to 20% of your portfolio can be in mid caps uh, and small caps uh, of course we would do it in our fund only if they Uh, uh you know fit into that thought process of having a strong comparative franchise in the industry in which they operate so i would say short answer it is possible to create alpha but the alpha outcomes will be smaller than what it will be in uh, small cap funds and it will most surely also be slightly smaller than what you could do in multi cap or flexi cap funds or even something like value opportunities where we can go across the multi cap spectrum so that was very aptly put uh, thanks vetri uh i think uh, we have a uh, short of time so we will take uh, two co- two more questions i guess this time uh, this is on gold uh, uh, since gold has actually done well i think the questions are coming here so there are two three questions on this uh question is like this the gold prices which i seen a record high in august have been going uh, south since then so what should be one's approach to gold and gold etf allocation today so i'm not an expert on gold but i think i'll just reiterate the two principles we have always reiterated on gold one it should be used as a insurance policy asset which means it is never part of your core asset allocation for wealth creation it is there as a insurance policy for the day something goes wrong it played exactly that role when something went wrong with the world it was one of the few assets which gave you positive returns uh, up to that period in august as the world has taken greater confidence in the fact that things will get back to normal it has taken a back seat in your portfolio and your growth oriented investments which are your equity investments have come to the forefront so it's about having a balance so should you have some gold in your portfolio i think the answer always is yes but it's your insurance policy as 
is there any environment in which i would expect gold to do well again over the next few years uh, it goes back to the second principle if you get a strong inflation outcome globally uh, which is possible because of the strong liquidity that central banks created then again gold is likely to play a role in terms of the fact that it does well during inflationary times these are the two principal uh, reasons for why anybody should look at gold in their portfolio but again it's not your wealth creation asset and gold did its job if it was in your portfolio it was the only part of your portfolio that gave you a positive return during the period of the crisis compensating you for the losses that perhaps happened in other assets which were in your portfolio and as those other assets have rebounded it has gone into maintenance thanks and what uh, so there's a follow up question here uh question is like this uh, would uh, does gold have uh, any impact on dollar index so is that the reason for dollar index to go down and what are its implication to near future and long term see correlations keep changing uh, this is something that i keep telling people that correlations in the markets are never con- constant um, typically weak dollar is associated with strong commodity prices uh, gold is also a commodity so that should also benefit but remember gold already did a significant rally when many other commodities were weak so if you look at august to today many other commodities oil steel copper have done far better uh, whereas gold which had already done very well in the earlier period actually took a back seat Uh, but in general weak dollar has been equal to strong commodity equal to strong gold but i would say again these correlations change and in my own career in 25 years i have seen the correlations change over time uh, you know people say strong uh, uh, interest rates equal to weak equity markets i have seen strong interest rates upward movement in interest rates even stronger markets because at that point of time the equity market interpret strong interest rates as being a sign of strong growth and confidence in the economy so correlations keep changing they are never consistent you have to always remember that correlation is not the same as causation uh thanks vetri one last uh, question uh from a risk reward perspective what should be the strategy to equities in the current market condition uh, particularly from new and uh, also existing investors here yeah. a uh, good question uh, niranjan good one to sign off on let me be very clear just as in march april we were continuously reiterating that you know there is a clear opportunity to rebalance your portfolio to go back to your core equity asset allocation that you are comfortable with because of the fall in equity prices today as well my advice would be the same stick to your asset allocation target and your investment plan and today when valuations maybe not in the whole market but certainly in the large cap companies has moved up into expensive territory i will still give the same uh, principle stick to your asset allocation targets if your asset allocation in equity has gone up above what your target is then obviously you must explore whether it makes sense to reduce it back to your target if you are significantly below your target because maybe you removed money too much uh, at the worst point of the panic earlier this year then you must start to make a plan for how you will top up your portfolio and bring the allocation back to your target so my simple mantra on this niranjan would be have an investment plan part of your investment plan must be your equity allocation target if you are above that bring it down if you are below that bring it up with this market rally if the allocation has gone above target by all due means bring it down within that you can decide which part to bring down some part you may want to keep higher those are details but stick to your asset allocation target is the main message that i would want to convey to investors thank you vetri back to you yeah great thank you uh, niranjan for uh, running us through those questions um, and thank you to all of you who have joined us here today uh, on this call and this broadcast uh, it's been wonderful to reach so many of you through this medium uh, through all these platforms where we broadcast this uh, and we hope that we'll continue to see uh, you know widespread participation from you uh, next year as well uh, in january and through the rest of the year Uh, i would like to use this opportunity to thank each and every one of you for your participation we look forward to your support in the times ahead and i would also like to wish each and every one of you your families your friends 
and everybody else in your circle a uh, very happy 2021 better times and good health for each and every indian and all citizens of this world thank you so much and have a wonderful evening Mutual fund investments are subject to market risks. Read all scheme-related documents carefully.